Okay, so in this video, we're, we're going to be looking at chapter 28.2, which is the ideal operational amplifier. So, um, basically, we're looking at this a device here, which looks kind of like this. Um, it's a it's an electronic circuit device with five five connectors, um, and um, I'm going to explain to you basically what it is, what it does. And I'm not going to explain how it does it, and we're going to look at theoretically how a perfect operational amplifier works, but what a physical, real op operational amplifiers look like. So, what does the operational amplifier actually look like, you might be asking. Well, I have a picture here for you, so you can take a look. And this is a bit of a simplified image. I mean, this is a bit of a complex image. But um, this is what it looks like simplified, and this is what a real-world one looks like more complex in a more complex manner. You can see that there's a lot of... Um, uh, connections on this one, and that it's kind of just a box. Well, op amps aren't just a box. Inside this, there's a it's a complex circuit of transistors, resistors, capacitors, diodes, and it just kind of all works together to make its function work. We don't need to know exactly how it works. We just need to know that it just it's um they're kind of pre-built, and you can just kind of slap them into devices, and they're very very popular these days. Um, in many electronic devices, because they are able to perform mathematical operations such as addition, um, subtraction, and any, many other operations depending on the design. And we're just going to look at the basic op amp now, which is um, able to add and um, subtract. Um, and um, I'm not going to. I'm going to explain in the next video how, what kind of applications you can use it for. But um, in this one, I'm just going to explain how it works, which might seem a bit counterintuitive, but that's how the syllabus puts it. So I'll just go with it. So um, so let's take a look. Um, we're going to first label these inputs so we know what we're dealing with. So, we have here is the, we have two inputs. We have the inverting input, and um, you kind of see why you need two inputs later on. We have inverting input, which is negative, and we have uh, non-inverting input, um, which is positive. And over here we have, uh, um, oh yeah, I'm going to explain how this works first. Firstly, um, most op amps have two power supplies. I'm sorry, not two power supplies, two inputs, and inverting and non-inverting. So, um, so if our inverting power supply is eight volts, and our a positive eight volts, and our non-inverting one is say six volts, um, what happens is the inverting one comes in and it becomes um, negative eight volts in here because it's inverted. So positive eight becomes negative eight. Non-inverting doesn't invert it, so it stays at six volts. And the resultant voltage gets they kind of get added together, and the resultant voltage becomes negative two volts. So the output will become negative two volts, but then it'll be amplified, of course. But so that's what um, not inverting and non-inverting means, and it works the other way around. So if I was to say make this one instead of ne positive eight volts, negative eight volts, this one here would become positive eight volts, and positive eight and um, plus six would be um, not two volt, ne negative two, but fourteen volts, fourteen, positive fourteen volts. So inverting input basically means it takes whatever um, coming in voltage is, it, whatever voltage is coming in, and changes the sign, times it, times it by negative one and um, adds it with these ones. So basically you get the difference between two, these two values because you're essentially minusing uh, the inverting input from the non-inverting input to get the resultant um, output. Okay, over here we have a um, positive power supply and over here we have a negative power supply. And um, the reason we need both a positive and a negative power supply is because, um, as you said, saw here, the output could be negative 2 volts or it could be 14 volts. The, power up, the um, output can be either positive or negative, but it can't be both at the same time. So sometimes the current will flow in a positive direction, which is that way, and sometimes it will flow in a negative direction, which is that way. So we, uh, the power supply needs to be both positive and negative. So um, how do we achieve this? Well, we normally have something called um, a double power supply. So we have a battery here, and then we have another battery here, so it's two batteries, except they're connected together, and they have something here called a zero volt line. So um, this, two ba this battery here, this one up here provides a positive, say, a nine volt power supply, and the one down here, say, provides a negative nine volt power supply, and in the middle, of the, this, the batteries are connected, and this makes a zero volt line in the middle, and um, this is called the zero volt line, and you might see um, Drawings are like that, which have arrows everywhere to all the inputs or all the connections. This is because, if we remember from potential difference, potential difference is always talked relative. We can say this is nine volts more than this, or nine volts less than this, but we can never say nine volts. That's it, nine volts. We always have comparative, and we normally compare to ground or to earth. But um, um, in this one, we're comparing to the zero volt line, which is the line between the two batteries. We say that's zero volts. Um, so this is 9 volts more than a line, this is 9 volts less than line. If this was a 6 volt non-inverting input, it would be 6 volts 
more than the zero volt line. Because remember, there's no absolute terms when talking about potential difference. That's why it's called potential difference. It means the difference between two potentials. Carrying on, um, so there's the power supplies, and finally there's the output, which is basically this added together, and then the energy gets outputted through here. So, um, how does this work? Well, um, I'd like to use an analogy here. Um, some people often get confused with op amps because you think amplifier, right? Okay, that means it takes a signal and makes it stronger or bigger, right? Well, that's what it appears to do, but that's not what it actually does. So, um, uh, here's my analogy I like to use. Okay, so um, if we're directly amplifying something, what we do, we're doing out uh, is, um, say, you want to you have an ice cream in an ice cream factory, and you think, wow, that's a fantastic ice cream. Here's my ice cream here. Um, and you say, that's a fantastic ice cream. Okay, but it's not big enough. We need a bigger ice cream. So, to amplify is you take that same ice cream, and you, um, I don't know, you blow more ice on it, or you blow more milk and water, and just you just make it bigger. That's called, that's direct amplifying. The indirect amplifying is where you look at it, you see, okay, it looks like this, and then you go back to your ice cream factory, and then you recreate the entire thing from new materials, as just a bigger form, but you well, you observed it, and then you just looked at it, and you observed it, and then you recreated it. But the, the new old one and the new one is not physically linked in any way. There's none of the, part, no part of the old one is in the new one. But if we just directly amplify it, the old one can, is still in the new one, except it's just more of the same. It's just the same old thing except more of it. But this one, we're just observing it, and that's what op amps do. These inputs here. Um, we, we say, you can basically imagine as if only one electron comes down this line, just so that one electron can be kind of captured and examined to see what the potential difference is. And then what it does is it takes these power supplies and recreates the difference between these signals, except amplified. So, if we said this had a gain of, say, if we just pretend this has a gain of 10 times, and um, we saw the difference between these two inputs was, say, 0 0.1 volts, um, what happens is when uh, it looks at it, it says, okay, the difference is 0 0.1 volts, I've examined it. Now it takes a power supply and routes it through and produces an entirely new 1 volt power supply. But what does that look like when you uh, run it constantly? Well, let's draw some, uh, let's draw a graph and take a look. So if we have a small, um, if we have, say, an uh, input alternating current that looks like this going through it, so there's our, there's our kind of with our input, and then it observes it. Sorry, it observes it, and then it recreates it. And when it recreates it, it'll look like this. It'll be the same thing, except with greater peaks. It's observed it, but it's taken a power supply and recreated it. It's not a direct amplification in the sense of a transformer, but it's more of a like a computer operational amplifier. Like I said, this is called an operational amplifier because it can do mathematical operations, but we'll go into that later. But um, it just observes things and then it recreates them using um, the power supplies. Anyway, um, the, it has many uses, as I said, we're going to go through that next time. But let's take a look at the um, conditions for an ideal amplifier, amplifier and see what they are in real life, because these are you know theoretical ideals. So the first one here, I've already listed them all down, is infinite input impedance. That means the inputs here, they theoretically have no electrons passing through, and it kind of just knows what the potential difference across um, on the other side of this wire or of the input is, but no actual inputs are coming in. So if I have, say, uh, um, if I have, say, connect this connected to, say, a 10-volt um, uh, battery, what it's going to do is, theoretically, no, this battery remain, maintains all its charge, and this op amp can just kind of sense that this is 10 volts. It just knows it's 10 volts. But in real life, we have probably a few electrons coming through. Very, very few. Um, there is a very high impedance. Impedance is a word that means kind of like resistance. It's not the same as resistance, but it means the ability of something to stop current. So you might be confused, but resistance is defined as the ratio between voltage and current, and impedance is defined as the ability of something to stop current. So um, it's a little bit different, but anyway... Um, it's saying that um, no electrons actually move through, and it just kind of knows. But in reality, a few do, but it's so few move through that it's negligible. So we can say that's kind of right. Zero out imp imp output impedance means that the output line basically has no resistance. Um, if you get six volts outputting, six volts will output. That's it. Six volts will just output. Um, very simple. Um, it's a assumption we should be quite familiar with because we make it quite often. The next one is infinite 
Out open loop game. Open loop means no feedback, which we're going to go into later. Feedback loop, which is in the next video. But open loop means um, no feedback, so that means when volts, uh, these go through, you'll reach saturation all the time. It means the gain is always equal to infinity. So that means um, even the tiniest voltage will reach saturation. What does saturation mean? Well, as you might have guessed, it's impossible for um, the output voltage to be greater than power supply because that's where it comes from, the power supply. And we can't create or um, we can't create or destroy energy. So um, the max energy out the max for output can be is the power supply. And if we have infinite gain, the smallest um, amount of any input will make it go straight to the power supply voltage. So that means infinite amplification. So if you imagine just any bit of positive at all, the, the, the new output current would look like that. So this is what the um, output current of uh, um, output voltage of an ideal op amp looks like. Um, as soon as you get any positive at all, you are getting a saturated um, signal. The only time there's no signal is when the signal is zero, because zero times infinity is still zero. But you know, any as soon as you have the smallest amount, you go straight to um, saturation, and that means uh, saturation V out is equal to uh, V of a power supply. Next one is infinite bandwidth. That means any frequency signal we can um, amplify in real life. There are limits because of uh, electronic circuitry. There are limits to what frequency signals um, we alternating currents or anything that we can or are able to amplify. But um, we put in the ideal one, there will be no limits. We can amplify anything. And the last one is infinite slew rate. Slew rate is a time lag between when a signal is taken in and a signal is outputted. Because remember, this isn't a direct transformation of this to that. This is a, I look at this and I remake it. In real life, there is a very, very small time lag. We're, looking, we're talking about microseconds. Um, the higher slew rate means the less lag there is. So infinite slew rate means instantly, as soon as this chain goes up, this one goes up. So there's no time lag in infinite slew rate. So now we've talked about all the ideal op amp um, conditions, and that's the end of this video. The next one will be a bit of a longer one, and we're going to go over the uses of op amps. Remember, it looks at the difference between the non inverting and the inverting. Non inverting minus inverting, and it gets the total, and then it amplifies it to um, by the gain, and then that becomes the output voltage. And it can go um, be negative or positive, which is why we have two power supplies positive power supply and negative power supply. And now, like, one last thing by convention, uh, positive power supply is always here, negative power supply is always here. Um, inverting inputs always on top, and non-inverting inputs always here, and output okay, outputs always here. And that's just conventions you need to know. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching my video, and I'll see you next time.